realizing that even if I had one year and four months, I would not have been able to read all or to make up a total picture of what this writer has acknowledged in her lifetime of the man. Famous as she is, obviously in Italy, but also translated into more than 30 languages, it's amazing that her name has not come up in the last 30, 40 years in the country where, this country, where after all talks about books, about women, liberation, freedom, opportunities, violence against the weakest, all the topics that from the 60s on have been discussed in the Norwegian society. But let's dive into this while she's here and see how far we get. We could have started anywhere. Fiesola, Sicily, Japan, Rome, the 18th century, the 1960s, the last few years. We'll see if we can somehow get around to these places. But since, after all, one book has been translated into Norwegian, let's start there. La Longa Vita di Marianna Ukria. Uh, Marianna Ockler's Lange Liv, The Silent Duchess in English, a novel, a novel from Sicily in the 17th century, historical, published in Italy in 1990 and in Norwegian in 1993. That was quite fast. <laughs> Marianna Ukrea is the main character, and now I want to ask you, where did she come from to you? Okay, okay. Uh, shall I use the same microphone or what? Yeah, <laughs> you should. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, you know, when they asked me why you wrote this book, um, it's difficult to say why, because for a writer, a book comes from very far away in a mysterious way. Well, that's, so I prefer to answer with a, a metaphor. So there is a, a character who knocked at my door. Mm -hmm. So I open the door, I make sit down the character, I offer a coffee <laughs> and uh, the biscuits and uh, the character tells me his, his or her story, and then he goes away, usually. When the character, after having taken the coffee and the biscuits, says, well, I would like a dinner, please, <laughs> and then ask me for a bed to sleep, and then in the morning a breakfast, that, that means that the character will stay, you see? This is uh, the way for me. It, it, it usually, is a character who comes. It, it's a little Pirandellian uh, way of uh, telling, but it is it's absolutely true. In this case, for Mariana, I went to Sicily, uh, but my mother is Sicilian, and uh, in visiting the ancient house uh, of the 18th century in Sicily, I saw a painting a very big painting, 
And I was very impressed by this painting because on one side, this woman, Marianna, the name is this, exactly her name, uh, she was dressed in a very official ceremonial, <coughs> ceremonial way. On the other side, she had something in her eyes which are very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And this contradiction was interesting for me. And, on, and, and in the end, she had in her hands a, a booklet with a pen. And I say, why? Because it's, it's unusual that in the painting you see a person you know, in a very official um, figure with a, with a pencil and the paper. And they told me, I, because she was there and mute. That's the problem. And I was impressed by this idea. Then I went away, I went to Rome, and uh, I found that she followed me. She was getting, pulling me by the knee. The, uh, and uh, she was knocking at the window. She was, because I was, uh, I didn't want really to write this book. Because I said, well, I don't know enough about Sicily in the 18th century. You know, it's difficult. And, um, but she was very insistent, very insistent. She wanted to be told. Uh, and then, um, I, so I started to read books about the 18th century. But in the books, there are no details. You know, for example, how much does a, a, a kilo of bread cost? Or what kind of shoes they were using? Or what kind of music they were listening to? Or, which the books they were reading, uh, things that for this history don't matter, but for a writer they are very important. The details are very important. So I had to work on uh, diaries, on wills, on um, letters, and uh, it was a very hard work, so I, it took me five years right? That, that's why I was uh, a little bit, uh, I didn't want to write the book because I understood that it was, uh, it was uh, difficult, I mean, difficult to find all these details. But at last I found these details were very interesting for me. And I, for me it was also a sort of traveling in the time, entering in another uh, world in another time, and I learned a lot of things which were very interesting. But it took me una gran fatica. So, so the thing that she was uh, deaf and dumb, that came from the picture. Yes, yes. And but you used it to your advantage because uh, <coughs> then she becomes a very special person. And also, which I find rather interesting, you invent a kind of uh, yes. thing that she carries around her waist. That's a kind of little table that she can and, and, uh, and block. Okay. She can write on. She can also, uh, always write because she cannot hear or talk. Uh, so she writes all the time and delivers these papers around. But then she was also surrounded by people who couldn't read. No, well, the, the, the thing is, well, maybe if we, if we put it on the middle, yeah. and maybe we close our chairs. Maybe <laughs> 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 we, we can use our chairs. <laughs> okay. Now, the problem is that, that women were not allowed to study. It was not important for a woman. Maybe very important um, families, the woman could uh, learn a little of uh, piano and some uh, conversation, but there was not any studies, important studies. But she was so stubborn and she wanted to know because she knew that the learning for her was a way to, when, to come out from this destiny of being um, mute and um, and she, she wouldn't hear. So she starts to uh, go to the library of the family and start to learn uh, reading. <coughs> reading. She learns how to write and read, which is, was very unusual, because usually women were oh. absolutely ignorant, come a mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, so she learned, and she, learned, she became a, an intellectual in a way, you know? 
and that, that is uh, um, fortune. That is her fortune because she becomes a little superior to the other women as she learns that she knows many things and she becomes uh, she becomes uh, more mature, more she can speak about the people, with the people, etc., etc. And uh, uh, that's why the father, the father is very, uh, he loves her. And she, he does something that is very unusual in that moment. Uh, he leaves all, uh, the, one of the big villa to the daughter, which was uh, definitely new which was absolutely uh, contrary to the tradition. Because usually, uh, the first male son had everything, no? In majorasco. Majorasco was a law for which the, the, the son, the, the eldest son, had everything. The others, the women went to the convent, and the men became or convent also, or uh, soldiers, you see? So the father does something that is very unusual. She, he gives this big villa to the daughter. And uh, naturally the other brothers uh, are very angry. But she is uh, so clever that she does something about this villa. Uh, and, uh, and uh, well, it's about this life. Oh, another thing I didn't uh, say, that in the before the French Revolution, uh, so before the end of the 18th century, the women uh, who were deaf and mute, they were put in uh, asylum, you understand? In, a, in a manicomio, because they were considered that they were incapable of listening the word of, uh, of uh, the church. So they were. So her destiny was to go in asylum. So the father, this uh, is save her from the asylum, marrying her to the uncle. To the uncle. Only the problem was that the uncle had been the rape of her. That's the problem. Well, this is all. I mean. She's, a, she did, she's two. She existed as a person. And she was deaf and mute, and she was married with an uncle. But naturally, all the details I had to be, I had to uh, invent because uh, there, was, there were no news about her. You see. But now you told us the, the secret in the story. <laughs> because uh, um, in the story, she is deaf and dumb. She is married to her. But she doesn't much know. She doesn't, she doesn't know. She doesn't know. She doesn't know. And also, uh, but some know. <laughs> of course, the husband uncle knows, and also the father. The father knows. knows. But there's the other don't know, and, and she doesn't know. know. And she doesn't. She she, has she doesn't know that she had been uh, she had been raped but by the by the. Her father. Her father is a kind of uh, pre psychotic <coughs> go. Because he thinks that some that that bad thing that happened. How can we do that over again? So he takes her to a hanging. Yeah, that's right. In the city. Yeah, this is the beginning. Yeah. This is the beginning. He thinks that uh, uh, a shock Another will say today a shock will uh, um, heal her, but uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> and so I have. Uh, I had the occasion to say, to, to, to tell, narrate what was, how cruel was the life. Because a, a boy of uh, 15, uh, he, he was a thief, just a normal thief, but she is being hanged uh, because uh, the law was very cruel. I mean, life was cruel. People were cruel, the society were cruel. No? So, uh, and I, this is true. I mean, this it was real that uh, even young people could be hanged because they just they they stole something on the road or in the house. You see. But the story that you give her uh, uh, by moving her away from from the normal standard by reading, uh, she gets um, another view at the world. 
but also in a way uh, because she has this old man that she does not love at all and she have, has fairly any sexual experiences. She reads books about love and sex. And then forbidden, forbidden, forbidden <laughs> books that she <laughs> learns from <laughs> libraries and buys. Uh, and then she gets a bad conscience for spying on other people's sex lives. Well, this is a casual. It's not that she's going to spy, but but uh, she goes down to the kitchen, you know, the big big houses with the big kitchen, and she this she, she she sees the lights and she goes and sees that uh, that uh, her um, the maid is going is making love with a uh, with uh, a man and uh, but she. Usually she doesn't know. She, she just uh, fell in this uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, well, naturally for her, it's forbid she doesn't know what is pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's true, because uh, uh, she was married to a man who was much older, and uh, he was a braver, and he was a very, how can I say, a very, very small person. Yes, yes. He, yes. he says the father is very intelligent. The father is another, is a yeah. very a nice person. person. He's, a, he's a intelligent. He understands the daughter. He he tries to help her, but uh, he dies also early. But at some point, she questions what what life is. What is a life of a woman in the century? And also in the aristocracy where she is placed. Uh, she says, um, what is life? It's, it's having children all the time. Keep the eight. But this was the destiny of women. Yeah. That that was the a, destiny yeah, they were married at more or less 13, 14, mm -hmm. and they had to make a child every year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, two things. They, they didn't have any time to cultivate themselves. Mm -hmm. Secondary, very often they died. Mm -hmm. They are died. You know that the population now is the contrary, but in that moment, the women were less uh, numbered than men because they were dying. I mean, they, uh, when uh, you you have uh, ten children, once you can die from thirteen on. Yeah, and many often, many of many women died of uh, uh, giving birth to a child. So it was a very hard life, and then also the life lasted 30 or 40 years. I mean, 40 years is, was already old. There is, you know, that there is in um, in Balzac, there is a moment in which uh, he says, "Saprocha and Veillard de cinquante ans." Veillardo de cinquante ans. Today is a young person, no? But in that moment, he was a. It was a Vigliardo, Vigliardo, you know, I don't know the, the word in English, but uh, it means very, very, very old person. <laughs> so, uh, the question would be, how come the mothers managed to marry off their 12 and 13 year old daughters? Well, you know, when the winners, no, they, don't, they didn't have any power. I mean, women, they, they had to do what... Uh, the husband or the father, it was a patriarchal, it's still now, but anyway, maybe. Uh, but then it was absolutely a hierarchic society in which the father was uh, deciding everything in the family. He had, he had the power of deciding everything. And that came from, uh, for example, from the Roman society, you know, the pater familias, in a Roman family, was uh, the absolute power. When, the, when in the Roman society a child was born, the child was brought in front of the father, and the father decided if he wanted to eat, get uh, uh, give the life to this, or, or the child could be thrown away. Mm -hmm. Very often, with uh, female child children, they were just thrown away, or they were killed, or they were given to somebody. Mm -hmm. And the father, and the father, and the father decided, this was the, 
Pate Familias was a very important uh, uh, hierarchy in the family, no? Now, naturally, now everything has changed, but specifically in the side of rights. But the, the, maybe symbolically, in the end of uh, our consciousness, there is still some idea about this hierarchy, no? Which uh, is not so easy. You can, it's easy to change laws. Mm -hmm. But to change the mind of the people is not so easy. It takes a long time. Yes. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, Mariana, uh, she outlives her old husband. And also, in the end, she chooses something that must have been historically very, very strange. <coughs> That's right. Well, you know, I thought that uh, I was beginning from her nascent, so I thought that she was going to die. Mm -hmm. no? And I was ready to write about her death. But she said, no, I don't want to die. <laughs> I can tell you, it's absolutely true. Writers, I mean, for me it's like that. I mean, the characters, at a certain moment, they become autonomous. They have a character. They say what they want. Oh, there are some authors who are, they say, no, you can't do, you do what I say. They are more, they are more dictators. But uh, when I was young, I was more like that. I thought that the author was a sort of uh, god. No? You do what you want. Then, uh, going on with the, my life, with the years, I understood that the, that the characters had a strong autonomy, and sometimes they say something, they want something, and usually they're right. They're right. Because they know better themselves than you. No? So, as a, as a director of an orchestra, for example, no? the, the director of the orchestra wants all the instruments to be all together and uh, do what he wants. But they are persons. And they are characters, and they are—they have their own personality. So a good uh, director had to deal, make a deal with the character of the of the characters, and at the same time the idea of the entire story of the. Well, it's not easy, not easy, because there is a fight sometimes. Because the character says, "Oh, I want to do this," and then you say, "No, I want you to do that," but. Uh, Usually, I learn that uh, the character is right. <laughs> <laughs> so you let her go out into the world. Well, it depends. I, when I wrote this book, I thought it was not interesting for people. I said, who can be interested in a book about a dead and mute person? I thought, really? And also, the, the publisher made a very small amount of then boom, when the very, I didn't know, I didn't expect. It was a great, great success. Last year I made the one million copy of this book. And uh, so it's, it's strange. There is something mysterious about the success of the book. And it's better than this like this. Or else they, a, a publisher will do only what they think that it could be a success. No? Success is something absolutely mysterious. <laughs> True. Sometimes you don't imagine, and then it comes. In a way, I think it's exotic because uh, these few hundred years has moved us so far from that, and still there are so many things that we can recognize, and also we can identify with her. Me being Zelda on one ear, <laughs> I can very much do that because I don't hear everything. Uh, but also, I think that um, uh, the male view of the female bodies, that's a, an important thing in this book, as you so, uh, Because they, especially around giving birth, getting pregnant, because they didn't know how it worked. And also, they thought that the women's bodies were only vessels for men's semen. Well, this comes That's from far away. This comes from uh, Aristotle, mm -hmm. who was one of the first who said that uh, the, before uh, also, well, there is a wonderful um, 
Dei by um, uh, Eschylus, Eschylus uh, which is a uh, uh, this history of uh, the, uh, Clitemestra and, um, and, he, and her son, no? Mm -hmm. Orestes, well, or Lorestia, Lorestia. And uh, which, which is very important symbolically because, uh, and I think that he, he understood the, the changing of the turning of the history. Well, uh, there is Oreste, no? Who killed the mother and uh, he is persecuted by the Furies. He goes around, he's, he's very unhappy, he can't leave. So he asks Apollo to make a trial, very important trial, of the gods. So they're all gods, male gods. Only the woman, the female god is Athena, who is, was born from the head of uh, no mother. Uh, and no mother. Well, they speak, they speak, they discuss, and then they say, oh, Oreste is innocent. Because he didn't kill the mother. He only broken the vase who contain this this same the, 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 the semen of the father. So the mother is a body that is a, a only concerning keeping and a, a, the a semen. But the uh, but the, the 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 beginning of the life comes from the semen of the father, you see. So in that moment, change everything. Because the power of a woman was in the fact that she could give birth to a, a, per, a person. So she, her body was a very powerful because she could give birth, no? But in that moment, uh, if you, you say that she is not the center of life, because the life comes from the father, and she's only something base that can uh, Maintain the the seminar of the other and change everything. So she's not the same, she's not the beginning of life that should come from her. Well, this has been very important because all the society afterwards, uh, Greek, Roman society, uh, medieval society, the father, come si chiama, il padre della chiesa, the church father, have this idea and they repeat it. Even some. Agostino, no? which I love so much. Sant'Agostino is wonderful. He's wonderful. He wrote something very courageous, which was a, a confession. No? He, he's a beginning of, a, of the novel, in a way. He's really the beginning of the modern novel, which is somebody who speaks about his own feelings. And he confesses many things about his life, etc., etc. Well, when he starts to speak about women, you can put your hands on it. Latte a ginocchio, as you say in Italian. Because he says things that you, see, that you say, well, why? He's so intelligent, he's so courageous. But uh, nothing to do. He says also, he says that the, the, the same of a woman is, uh, is uh, not important, that uh, the woman is uh, more less intelligent than the man, many things that are absolutely misogynous. It's very strange because he had a mother, Santa Monica, who was a very open woman. She was very intelligent, she was very uh, courageous. But, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, when uh, there is a, um, an idea which uh, uh, belongs to your uh, to your to your peer, your 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 society where you live, it's difficult to go against this idea. Mm -hmm. So the, this idea go around, and that people believe in that. You see. So specifically, if you say that this has been said by God, mm -hmm. how can you say contrary? How can you be contrary to God? Impossible. So it. Uh, it was very hard for the for the people to well I think that the only really revolutionary person was Christ. Historically, I'm speaking as a like person, musician, not, uh, not religious, but but Christ was the only one who said something absolutely unusual. For example, love your which, for example, was a word against slavery. 
was the world again. And he was the one when, who, when he died, no? When he died, and then he uh, reappeared, he appeared to three women. And he said to these women, go and say to my apostoli, my apostoli, that I am here. And uh, it is, for us, it seems something very normal. There were three women. He said to the women, go and say. But it was not. It was a very, very revolutionary thing. Because in that moment, women had no right to um, testify. To testify. They couldn't testify. So he gave them the possibility to testify. This is very, 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 very important. It was a change of the self. In the, what uh, I understood studying uh, the medieval, 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 the Middle Age, because I wrote a book about um, Santa Chiara, no? mystic. What was uh, very important, what I learned, it was that the medieval, which we imagine something uh, very, a whole, something very compact. Well, no, it was a fight. There was a complete a, a, a journal uh, fight between those who believed in the words of Christ and the, the others who believed that the church was a power, was an a empire. With the Constantino, no? the, the church becomes an empire. Well, an empire needs an army, needs a, a war. They want to go to war. They make the, uh, the crusades, and uh, the, the la pena di morte, etc., etc., which belong to the power, to the to empire. Well, many people didn't believe, didn't want the church to become an empire. The church <coughs> should be near to Christ and then near to his idea, which they were very simple and very li li uh, linked to poor, to poverty, you see. And this was a, was a very strong fight, struggle. And San Francis and, uh, and uh, Chiara, uh, Claire of Assisi and many others, they were fighting all the time. And you know why they haven't been considered heretics? Because they were popular. <laughs> they were so popular that they came from all over the world, and the church didn't dare to condemn them. But they could be, could have been condemned as heretics. Because they, they said, we believe in Christ, and we don't want the war. St. Francis was absolutely against the war. He went to uh, Egypt uh, and, uh, and uh, spoke with the Sultan and said, why are we going to, to, to kill each other? We can uh, make uh, something, uh, let's say, a friendship. And, uh, but uh, they were preparing the cruiser. They came there and they said, go around, go away. We will make the war. And in that war, there were more than 5,000 of people died, even children and uh, women died of the cruiser. So you see, this is very interesting, this, uh, this uh, fight between the church, inside it the church. It is very interesting. But I think we could do a little more um, up to, to one of your latest uh, titles. Uh, through this, um, the thoughts about the body and um, also uh, the male fight for the female body. Because in one of your latest books, uh, Corpo Felice, uh, the content body, a happy body, a satisfied body, if you try to translate it, um, that is a totally different uh, kind of novel. Yeah, well, that is a, that is not a novel. It is a story. No, what the French call a récit is a something that uh, between the autobiography and the essay, because I start from something that happened to me that I lost a child, and uh, in the same time I try to understand what is the story of the maternity mm -hmm. in the history. In the history, and it's a 
this is modern times. Modern, yes, mm -hmm. that's right. And it's very interesting because, as I said, the, uh, the maternity, the idea of maternity is something that comes from history. It's nothing to do with nature. I mean, the nature is there, but what we do with nature is the interpretation of the nature which is important. Mm -hmm. no? Uh, for example, let's say the idea of virginity. No? We believe that virginity is very important. Uh, there is a whole mythology about virginity. Well, once I was in Africa and I was uh, uh, traveling in, uh, in the, in the Af African era, in the middle of Africa, and I met uh, a population, very interesting population. I was speaking with the people, in the, with the women in this uh, population. And uh, at a certain moment came out the idea of virginity. And they told me, virginity? But that's awful, awful. A woman, a woman who is virgin is considered out of the society <laughs> because she doesn't give, she didn't give the uh, proof that she could give birth to a maternity. So, if they, before marrying a woman, they had to make a child with a woman. <laughs> because, because the very important thing for them was to make a woman. A woman was important if she did many children. But virginity was completely, a, a, how can I say, a non-value, an anti-value, you see. But this, you, for, to understand how uh, the ideas that we believe in, sometimes they, they come from history. And, uh, and one where the church, many responsibility at the church, for example, uh, the, the sexophobia of uh, the church is very strange because usually the ancient religions uh, were, um, uh, were defending and exalting the sexuality because you need sexuality to make children, no? All the ancient uh, ancient religions, there was the idea, Indian religion, uh, Egyptian religion, there are the mother and the father, they live uh, together and they make children. Well, the, uh, the Catholic Church uh, is based on the fact that uh, the sex doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. The mother, the Maria, uh, doesn't have any sex. She uh, comes pregnant because of the spirit uh, santo. And uh, all, the, all the character of the church is made against sexuality. There is a sexuality which is particularly strong in the Catholic Church. And uh, uh, this is uh, naturally, if you believe that the sex is bad, is, is uh, evil, and the and the body of women is uh, sex, is temptation, then the body of women becomes, uh, becomes uh, diabolic, mm -hmm. dangerous, you see. Well, today is, uh, uh, the, today the, the, the Muslim is the same thing. If you ask to a Muslim woman why, or a Muslim man, why you put your veil, they say because don't, we don't want to, uh, Give a suscitare temptation. No, suscitare the verb. Alert, no, so give, give. To uh, tempt. Yeah, give temptation, give temptation to men. Yes, they say. Is that this is the reason for what they go all, not for uh, religious reason, because they want, they don't want men to be tempted by the female body, you see. Well, this is also a very strange kind of uh, uh, sexophobia, mm -hmm. no? We, we have in common this uh, sexophobia. And then the, today, even today, I mean, this idea that uh, the sex, for example, in Italy, from, the, from the, uh, 1861, the, the uh, union of the Italian uh, country, the, in the school, this, there was somebody who started to ask for education, sexual education. Never accepted. Even now, we don't have the sexual education in the school. I was saying, the, the problem for me is the word sex. 
And I was saying, why don't we call it education to the sentiments? Mm -hmm. No, it's true, because it's the education to the sentiment, because sentiment and sex should go together. Pleasure, sentiment, sex. But uh, nothing. And this is the church. I mean, this church, not the one of San Francisco or Chiara, but the church of the sexophobia is, uh, uh, doesn't want uh, children to learn something about sex. So that's why they were after you in the 60s when you wrote books about women and sex. And sometimes, sometimes. I have sometimes. also some process. <laughs> But this, uh, go back to the Corpo Felicia, uh, because um, what you do there is you, you start with uh, the biographical words and you develop a story that is about an unborn baby that dies, but still you make a life story out of it. Well, I imagine, you know, this, uh, writing is imagination. And um, I imagine to uh, speak with this uh, little boy who died, but uh, I thought uh, why I couldn't go on with a sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, conversation with this boy. And what I learned by my friends, for example, I had friends who were feminists and they had uh, children, and very often I, I, I noted that these children, when they were 14, 15, mm -hmm. they uh, revolt against the mothers and they uh, uh, became very enemies of, uh, of, uh, of uh, families, for example. But I can understand because it's, it's normal that a, a, a boy or a girl about 15 revolts against the parents. This is normal. But it is a very dangerous moment because they don't know what to do of themselves. Sometimes they fell in the trap of drugs. Sometimes they go uh, the trap of uh, a sort of um, groups of uh, young boys who they become very cruel. And so I imagine that he could, <coughs> he could, became a sort of uh, uh, bad boy. And uh, what uh, happens at the end, that uh, love changes the person. Because I think that only love can change a person. Mm -hmm. Because love wants to know better. No? If you love somebody, you want to know better. If you use a body as an object, doesn't, you don't want to know better. It's an object, you throw it away. This is prostitution, for example. But if you love a person, you want to know better, and you become more respectful in front of this person. That's what can change this boy. This is all my imagination. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was my idea that I could, this, this boy could become a good man because he loves somebody. Uh, that was one of the more biographical. Starting points. The other one, when I look through your book list of books, is your very early experiences with your mother and father in a far country of Japan. Ah. You have to tell us about that because it's very special. <coughs> yes, it has been maybe, maybe the more important experience of my life. When I was, uh, for those who don't know, my father was anthropologist. And uh, we went to Japan, I was one year old, and uh, uh, we lived very well in the north of Japan. I was, uh, my father wanted us to be very integrated, so I was using to speak Japanese, to dress Japanese, to eat Japanese. I, sp I saw myself as a little Japanese girl, <laughs> even if I was blonde and white and strange, but uh, blue eyes, which were strange. Um, well, in '43, uh, when Italy was divided into two pieces, the South was already liberated by the Allies. The North, and from from Rome to the North, was still in the hand of the Nazis, Nazi fascists. 
So they made an alliance with Japan and Germany, and they asked all the Italians who were living in Japan to sign an agreement with the, uh, the Republic of Salo. My mother and my father, both, separately, that's interesting, not only my father, but also my mother, they were asked, do you sign for this? And they were not politically uh, engaged at all, but they were against racism, very, very strong. You can imagine, an anthropologist must be. <laughs> but uh, also my mother, courageous, because she knew that uh, she would be there with the children. And they said no. They said no. And they said, uh, you know that you're going in a concentration camp? And they said, all right. I mean, very, yes, very Christian. And uh, very courageously, um, they, they took us with a camion, a camion, with a truck, and they brought us to a concentration camp, which was not a concentration, a stemiating concentration camp, but it was a very, very hard concentration camp. I mean, uh, uh, hungry, first of all, because we didn't, we, we had something like this of rice every day, only the only rice without meat, without fish, without uh, vegetable, nothing. And at a certain moment, we became all uh, ill of uh, beriberi, scorbuto, anemia. You know, uh, hair was falling, teeth were falling, and uh, uh, parasite. And um, for example, I was eating ants for Mickey, because I was so hungry. And could, we could eat anything, you know. If there was a, a mice just going around, <laughs> I'm taking and eating in the bus. Because when you are very, very, very hungry, you get everything. And I remember my father said, stop eating ants, please. Because <laughs> ants have, you know, la acido formico, which is very poisoning, mm -hmm. it's uh, dangerous. But uh, I could eat everything, anything. So I used, I was uh, six years old. Um, I used to go through the iron wires, and uh, I, because I was a child, I was not so, they couldn't see me. And I uh, went to go with the peasants to, uh, to pick uh, to tomatoes or potatoes. I was working. Now, at the end of the day, they would give me two potatoes or one tomato, etc. But they were very kind, I must say, because they could uh, denounce me because I was out. But the people, they were, they couldn't bear the war, the, these people, of the, the guards, the military, they were all with us. So this is very important because it made me understand that the, that the Japanese population were with us. They were not with the, with the, they understand the, the, the police, they were very sadistic. They were sadistic. They, for example, they would stay on um, a terrazzino, a, a, a terrace. They would eat in front of us. They were, they were very happy to eat a lot of things. And sometimes they took, for example, a head of a fish and they throw it. To, and, uh, and we children were jumping to, to take or a piece of... Uh, uh, or, uh, orange, or, uh, you know, just to see, and they were laughing. This is sadistic, no? And for example, we couldn't, uh, we stayed in this uh, courtyard, which was very, very sh small, because to sleep we had a place nearly like one meter for one meter. So we stayed all the day in the courtyard. In the courtyard, there were some. Uh, French, what is your French. And uh, you know, it was forbidden to to go back, to appoggiarsi, to, to, to <laughs> lean on the bench. They were coming with the bastone, with a stick. To, uh, so this is sadistic because what they. Uh, we were so weak, so weak, they, we wanted to. So we were keep, keeping each other with the shoulders, you see. And then, uh, well, uh, this is important because my father, who knew very much uh, the tradition of uh, Japanese uh, culture, uh, he was saying all the time to this uh, 
to these uh, gods. Uh, well, why the children? The children can't be considered prisoners of war. They are children. Uh, and they will say, oh, they are children of uh, traitors, so they are traitors. That's, uh. So he went on, went on. At the moment, he remembered that uh, in the Japanese culture, samurai culture, if you cut a finger and you throw it to your enemy, you make him an uh, obligation. And, uh, uh, and you, you become important. So he, I remember we were in the culture, and my father said to my mother, uh, you know, there is a, a little bottle of uh, wine that we had, uh, he had uh, uh, conserved, uh, reserved from, from when we came in. And uh, she brought it down. She didn't know anything. He took the axe, he, he cut his finger, he threw it on the police, and uh, it was a sort of uh, scandal. They shouted, they, they screamed. You know, he was all dressed in white with this figure with all the blood. Uh, but the incredible thing is that uh, after a week, he came, this soldier, uh, policeman, he came with a small uh, goat. A goat which gave us some milk. You see? It works. 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 I mean, not much, but he, this little goat uh, gave us, I don't know, 100 or qualche cento grammi of uh, milk, which is a milk, uh, the goat milk is very rich, mm -hmm. and saved our, our life, really, because we went, I, was, I was going for food, because I couldn't stand, for example, for, for hunger. So this little milk, was for us very, very important. But he lost his finger. He was also dying of uh, uh, infection in certain moments. Yes, it was uh, very hard. And how, the, how do you think these amazing and terrible experiences influence your life and your writing? Well, I think that uh, it influenced uh, very strongly. First of all, that uh, I expect uh, any moment that an anything could happen. I am ready to die in any moment. Uh, even if I like, li I like life, I like life. I'm not suicidal, no, <laughs> at all. But uh, but I expected uh, that that could be there and could uh, kill you in any moment. First of all, secondary, my relation with food. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't eat much, but uh, I have an imagination on food because when we were there, we were speaking all the time about food, <laughs> all the time. And so my mother sometimes said, "Must have a little must because we were always speaking about food. And so now, for example, if I go and see a a, a, a shop with a with the things to eat, I can stay there <laughs> looking. Not, I don't eat much, but I like to look at it because it's the richness of food, which is wonderful for me. And I like to cook, specifically for friends. And I like the abundance. The, I like to be able to that. And uh, that's the second thing. Third thing, uh, I never throw away food. I can't. I can't. I keep them inside. My mother said, Basta, but it's butta mia. <laughs> but uh, I try always to find an animal, a place, or something. Because for me, it's impossible to, to throw away the food. Because this food is so important, you see. So, uh, and this is also important. And then uh, the idea that uh, you have to be faithful to your own ideas. Mm -hmm. This was the example of my father's. You know, many friends of ours, they were saying, oh, but why did you do it? You, uh, you risk your life. You shouldn't do it for the children. I, I don't agree. I think that they did well, because, because it was an example. All my life I've been of this example. I know that uh, 
uh, it, it, it's important to be faithful to your ideas, even if it's risky. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. This was uh, the learning mm -hmm. from the camp. And also your mother lived until she was 102. <laughs> so you, you are made of a heart. Yes, I, that's very strange. No, I mean, you know, after the war, they, well, in that moment, the, the Americans, they were the angels. They were coming from the sky. The Americans, they were so... In that moment, they were wonderful. They cured us. They gave us... I remember a, an American medicine, a doctor who was uh, making an exam to me. I remember these words. This girl, this little girl has a heart like a... Is she a Can imagine? A eggplant. Because it was so black. Because it was gonfio. Uh, I remember that words, and but they did all what they could to uh, to give us uh, to, to eat, etc. Et and when we get, came back to Italy, you know, they say, "Oh, you were bad, well in the concentration camp <laughs> after eight months of uh, eating, eating, curing, and everything." We were, yeah, well, in a way, no? And they were saying. Ah, ma non è che siete stati così male, eh? non è che avete sofferto così tanto la fame. The same thing says a uh, uh, lady, Primo Levi, for example, he says at a certain moment, no? he, because after the war it was not easy to go back. They were, we had to stay there to wait for a ship for eight months. Well, also, also, uh, a povero Primo Levi, he couldn't go back before one year. And in this year, he had to eat, he had to cure, you know, he was a, And when he went back, they said the same thing. Ah, but it was not so terrible. So <laughs> Concentration camp, no, because he was uh, 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 completely changed. So it's very difficult to, to say about this. I think the time is flying really fast, and you could have kept it here for all night. I think I'll round it up in a way um, uh, that you have um, contributed it yourself. If I pick keywords from the titles, your titles, I could end up with a lot of negative ones. Malessera, ladra, guerra, boy, ultima notte, robato, battaglia. But also felice, dolce, seduzione, festa. I did not find love or amor in any of your titles. Maybe there is one. But still, uh, there is hope in your texts. I think maybe that also is something that has a connection to your bad experiences. Yes, um, because I always, <coughs> even if I am suffering, suffering, and uh, I was not sure of coming out from this, uh, well, you know, every day, <coughs> these guards, they will put us all in front of us, in front of us, and they will say, when we win the war, you will be all killed, you know. <laughs> to a child, it's terrible to, to, to see. And I was thinking, oh, my sisters, my mothers, I was, oh, I was always the night thinking that we would be all cut their throat. You see, we didn't know if we were winning the war or not. We couldn't know. So I was living in fate and horror and in, 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 in fear, fear. And, uh, but in the same time, something very, very deep inside me was uh, feeling that I could do it, that I, I had to do it, that we could go out and come out from this, uh, and it was, uh, it was important. I mean, I never absolutely, completely uh, give, up. give up. I thought it was a struggle, mm -hmm. but uh, I thought that it, I never accepted this. I, it was a struggle, mm -hmm. and I didn't know if I could come out, but uh, I was always struggling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
the last thing I wanted to ask you about is um, future. Uh, getting older in a new century, as we all are. Uh, although your activity seems uh, not to lessen on the country, both you and I, I was born on, at the other end of the same world, have to realize that age will have some consequences. In the Mariana Bukria book, uh, The Happy Nomad Mariana, uh, in the end of her book, is given a new traveling star. She, she didn't was want to die. The she <laughs> She's not dying. <laughs> Even if the age she lived in looked upon her as an old 40 year old, as an old one. Mm -hmm. But do we meet somewhere as 100 year old nomads, you and I? Or is the internet the new world? Well, I think there is a dialect, the dialectic relation. I mean, I don't believe in this separation between uh, the people. I mean, we are all together in the same ship. <laughs> and uh, we have to be solidar solidarity is very important. I believe in uh, this uh, value of solidarity, specifically between women who have been always separated one from the other. And also with the, those who don't believe, who have other believings, why not? I mean, I believe in rationality and relation. I, I think that we can resolve all the problems, we could, we could resolve all the problems with rationality and with, the, I mean, speaking. Trattare, mm -hmm. Negotiation. 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 I could. I think the war is something really horrible. Is uh, when when the world when the war starts, there are no more words. The words finish. The, uh, the you have an enemy. You are all on this side or another side. You simplify life, which is complicated. Uh, the acceptance of complication for me is a, a wise thing. When you start to simplify and say, those are wrong, I am right, this is my God, the other God doesn't exist, I want to kill all the other people. This is simplification, it's, it's very, very dangerous and uh, <coughs> terrible, terrible, because, because life doesn't exist anymore, the, the, the ideas don't exist anymore, Rationality doesn't exist anymore, and everything becomes being on one side, on the other side. War is this. And uh, I had enough. For more. <laughs> so, some kind of <laughs> Yes, yeah. in a way. I hope. <laughs> if anyone wants to ask for anything, yes. Well, well, I have a comment if you, if you don't mind. Yes, certainly. Um, Give me a minute, please. Um, because um, my name is Greta. Um, I have been following uh, Dasha Marini for some time because I'm my master. I'm, at, I'm uh, translating one of her books. Uh, I knew uh, the great uh, Dasha Marini before I was uh, starting on my master thesis. Uh, no, so far, I know her. And even better, Tasha Marini uh, is a is a very great and very she has a vast production in uh, in Italian. She has so much to tell us. Uh, it's a very it's a pity that she's been oh, she's been translated only once in the middle in the middle of the nineties, I think, in, in a, a one only one book. And therefore, one year ago. I sent a message to Dacia Maraini and asked her if she would mind if I translated one of her books into Norwegian. Um, and she has been so kind to me during this year, uh, communicating with me, uh, telling me that, that she would really much like to, to have other of her great productions translated into Norwegian. Um, 
some uh, weeks ago, uh, Yildendal told me to send, send them some uh, extracts of my translation. I have tra I've been translating uh, Tre Donne, uh, which is, uh, which is a very interesting uh, novel. Um, I've, I've translated the entire novel so far. They told me to, to, to send them some ex extract, and they told me, actually, to give me, they told me, after having received my extracts, they told me it was very interesting, they would like to have a closer look at it. And so they told me to, to tell me mm -hmm. before the end of March whether they would like to publish the whole novel. So I would like, I, I, I'm sorry I can't, but I would have a right to tell you all tonight that, that they will be. But they didn't tell me, and since I'm so timid, <laughs> um, I haven't asked them to tell, tell me before this event. I'm but sorry. I would so much like, because I'm sure most, many of you have been reading the great production of Dasha Marini. She, she has so much to tell us. She's, she's been living a, such, a, such an adventurous life, and she's been reading such a lot of interesting literature, and she has such a great capacity, and she has the capacity also to see a story from different angels. For example, three, three, donne, three women that I have been translating. It's so thrilling because at the beginning I thought, oh, it's just a story like any, any, any other story, but it isn't. It's so truly, it's so fascinating reading about these three ladies in, in three generations. But, uh, I would just like to, to, to tell you uh, that it's a pity Dacia Marini hasn't be, been translated, but she will be. <laughs> and, 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 uh, she's been translated and, and she will be translated. Uh, you, in Norway we have more than 300 in English. Editors. Uh, I, I, I ask you now because I think, think they're the best. And I think you now it will be the best for you. Oh, And uh, she was a, she was writing books uh, for children. Then my mother, my grandmother, the, the mother of my father, called Joy Cross uh, Cornelia, also her name, Cornelia Berkeley Cross. She's also a writer. By the way, now in London they are write, they are publishing a book of hers after a long time. She wrote in the nineteen uh, ten. Uh, and uh, uh, my father also, he's an anthropologist, but he wrote many books uh, on Japan, on Tibet, uh, and also a novel. Uh, so it comes from my family. And uh, I started when I was 13 years old, writing in the <coughs> newspaper of uh, my school. Uh, and then I went on forever. I mean, uh, I never stopped. And uh, when, you see, when I, we came from Japan, we were so poor that we didn't have anything except the dress that the American gave us. And, but the only thing we had were books, because they were there for the family, from the family. And, uh, and I was very happy because the only richness 
in the house. I remember going with the shoes with the holes. Uh, we didn't have money for new shoes, but the books were there. And I had uh, a really wonderful books, uh, many in English, so I learned English from these books, and um, classics. And I started very early to read and read and read. I'm first of all a reader. I think that uh, the love of reading is something. So I always bring with me a book. You know? I was uh, also sometimes teased. They, they were teasing me because I was walking, reading. Sometimes I fell down because I know, once I was going in, on a ski, a uh, ski lift. You know what is a ski lift? Oh my God! And I fell down. So. Um, uh, for me, it's very important to, I mean, to read always. Even when you are getting old, I couldn't live without reading. Luckily, luckily, I don't know if it's luckily, I, I suffer of uh, insomnia. insomnia. <laughs> I sleep very little. So I, I wake up in the night, I start to read. So I go and I read and read and read. Much I like to read. And, uh, Classic in a way, and also modern, right? Also because I am in the jury of some prizes, and I have to read books, and I like to read books. But uh, read and writing, they are they are together. I mean, I don't understand those who say I don't read, but I write. <laughs> I know somebody. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe then we should go to the floor. Please, please. Yes, um, I've just seen uh, 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 on YouTube a short uh, presentation of you and of your work. You, were, you mean on the web? On the yeah, YouTube, on the YouTube. YouTube. On the YouTube. Yes, and uh, one of the questions you got and you tried to or did answer was where or what is your identity? Ah, ah. First of all, I want a question about your identity. And that's a very, very dangerous topic. Uh, you're to right. Touch. And you, your answer was uh, not surprisingly uh, a language. A language. Uh, it's, yes. It's, Perhaps a matter of course for the writer. But as you know, in this time of migration, this question of identity is very much stressed by writing uh, political occurrence. But it's important for every person. And so my question is for you. Be satisfied by answering that your identity is your Italian, Italian language. <laughs> yes, you're right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I would say, if, if you ask me what is a, the identity of a person, I believe that the language is very important. Not the religion, because it's something that uh, belongs to many countries. So, not the, uh, the flag, not uh, the um, boundaries, but uh, the language. The language is a big thing. But in the same time, I believe that we can have several identities. So I don't believe that we have only one identity. Because uh, this would be limiting. I mean, today, specifically today, that we are so going around in the, uh, globalization, I think that we can have several identities. I can be Italian, but I have something of the Japanese, because I lived there, and they left me some, some, some important influence, or uh, an identity of, uh, uh, of my grandmother and mother who were English, for example, or the identity of Sicilian. Uh, so, uh, the identity is a complicated amount of things that goes together. I think that uh, 
simplification of uh, be, be thinking that identity is only a question of passport is, uh, I don't think it, it's valid. No, maybe you agree with me. Yeah. I do agree. So naturally, we have something in the identity which is more important. Uh, but we have lots of identities. One can be Norwegian and uh, uh, Anglican, or Norwegian and Catholic. There are different identities that can go together. Norwegian and half uh, Italian, for example. Uh, no, and uh, I don't think that the, the different identities are uh, necessary in, uh, uh, in war between each other. I, I think that they can go together if we have a, a nice relation with our identities. Because sometimes we hate an identity and that creates a problem. You know? But uh, yes, I believe specifically today, in which there are, there are this uh, change of population, and moving of population, and the globalization uh, uh, make people have to deal with several identities. Thank you. <laughs> At that point, uh, continuing this, uh, I suppose you would agree saying that one could willingly acquire other identities, mm. Mm. which means opening towards the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's something that changes yeah. completely, uh, you, usually. I mean, it's not something it's there forever. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's not something that is... Uh, uh, like the passport. You have the passport, is there. But willing we also. It's not willing to, willing to yeah. change, yes, yeah. certainly. When we travel, yeah. not like bags, but we, we travel, we want to know about the world, we risk something, because we risk the idea to encounter another ideas about the world, but it is very important for us to deal with uh, this uh, different kind of uh, identity. Thank you. Um, the last question here. Yes. All right. I wanted to ask you something about the condition of women in Italy right now, because I'm sure you have a few on this very hot topic, and we all know that, that there is a very large number of women who get killed by ex-husbands, current husbands, uh, boyfriends, ex-boyfriends, and so on. So far this year it's 17, I believe, and uh, there has been a very large number over the last five, six years. Um, 17. I think it's 17. 17 since the, the 1st of January. Of the ah, year. I think uh, uh, of January, yeah, because in a year there are yeah, 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 no, more so than 200. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, I'm just wondering, it seems like this phenomenon is not stopping, it's not about to stop. What do you think are the main reasons for this? Yes. Right now? Thank you for the, it's a very important question. Well, I believe, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I believe that this is the reaction to the autonomy of women. I mean, uh, when uh, uh, naturally certain men who are more weak, more fragile, the men who identify their virility with possession, they believe that uh, this woman is mine because I love her, this is mine. This uh, child are mine, this family is mine. And when uh, this woman who is considered possession of a, a man says, uh, no, I go away, because usually it's uh, always the reaction comes from the moment in which she says, I go away. He enters in a, such a crisis, such a crisis, that he loses his mind. It's true, because they're not criminals. They are men, like others. But uh, they can become so uh, tragically uh, involved that uh, they can kill also themselves. Many of these killers, I mean, uh, those who kill their husband, uh, wife, or, they kill themselves afterwards. So this means it's, it's a very, very strong crisis. It's something not only egoistic, but it's something that gets them mad. And it is specifically those men who believe that a woman is a possession, their propriety. They, they don't accept the idea that the propriety is, uh, is uh, 
somebody takes them away the propriety, you see. It's a possession. I think that the terrible thing in this moment is the idea of possession, which you can't possess a person. It's a slave. Even a child, even a baby, a baby just born is not yours. If you think in the history, if you go to the chronicle, you see that uh, women often kill children yeah. because they believe that they are their own. No? And men, they usually do it with, with uh, women. But there is uh, the, the problem of the fact that the, the, there is an augmentation of these uh, uh, cases. I, I think it is because women are more uh, autonomous. They say, I want to go away, you see. But naturally, I don't believe that men are they, they, the men born, born, born with this uh, violence. It's not a question of gender. There is a book in Italy very interesting called Dalla parte delle bambine of uh, a woman called uh, Elena Giannini Belotti. And she uh, says, very interesting because she has been working with the children, she says that till two years old, uh, girls and, and boys uh, behave exactly in the same way. They have the same reaction uh, of aggressivity, of uh, uh, tenderness, of uh, working, of love, etc., etc. And she said, at two years old, start the uh, uh, preparing of the uh, separation of roles. You know, they teach uh, girls to, for example, uh, if you want to get something, you have to to to, to uh, smile, for example. Instead, the boy says you have to be hard, and <coughs> demand strong, and demand for your uh, what you want. And in that moment, start the knowledge for women of the uh, language of. Uh, um, la lingua della, uh, della seduzione, of seduction, of seduction. <laughs> and uh, women are forced to use the language of seduction, which is terrible because uh, it's on your body, it's on your uh, beauty or something that external that doesn't uh, take uh, care of all the complexity of a person. You're not a person, you are a body. No? And uh, the language of uh, seduction is very, very common. Uh, television, uh, games, uh, uh, all the, all, they are all based on the fact that women have to uh, use the language of the seduction. And I think that's terrible. For a woman, it's also mortifying because a woman is a person with the complexity of her personality. Is not only seduction. No, seduction, but seduction is a strong language. It's a strong language, and many women believe only in that language. They don't believe in their own intelligence. They believe that uh, that is the language. So you see, for example. Sometimes in the television you see women uh, who speak about politics, or, uh, but they are there and they speak with their body, which is so uh, um, seductive that uh, you don't believe in what she says. Well, I tell you what's in Spain, not strange, but, uh, uh, a little uh, girl, once I was, uh, they were, we were looking at television, and uh, she says, uh, oh, tell me. What is strange because in the same room she's all naked and he's all with the cravatta with her. and she says, but she's not cold and uh, why he not uh, he's not uh, warming he says, why yeah they are in the same room it's a very a, a little child says something very ingenuously you know but it's true I mean this is the language of seduction they don't believe in the language of the intelligence of uh, of uh, your character, of your story, of your destiny, no? 
So I think that uh, we thought we should uh, um, we should try to go away from this uh, uh, language, which is uh, very often is imposed. It's imposed to women, mm -hmm. so it's difficult. Certain works, for example, they impose you to 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 use that language. Mm -hmm. But I think we'll say thank you. Thank, thank you. For